Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and welcome to the show. My guest this week is Matt Hansen, who just went to the Canadian Screen Awards with a Best Original Screenplay nomination for Zoom, a multiplanar ensemble drama coming to theaters in North America later this year. It's also opening Brazil this Friday, but that's just a happy coincidence. The reason this episode is dropping now is because this week marks the start of the 2016 baseball season, and Matt picked Field of Dreams. You know Field of Dreams, right? Phil Alden Robinson's 1989 adaptation of W.P. Kinsella's novel Shoeless Joe? The ultimate male weepy? The sports movie for people who don't like sports? It's the one where Kevin Costner plays Ray Kinsella, an Iowa farmer motivated to build a baseball diamond in his cornfield by a mysterious voice, and then finds that diamond populated by the ghosts of the Chicago Black Sox, who've returned to set Ray on a journey of discovery that leads to... I'm sorry, I got a little choked up there. Nominated for Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Original Score, it didn't win any of them, but that just adds to its stature as a beloved underdog. And it's a movie that tells you that it's okay to get a little choked up. This is someone else's movie. Two things. Three things. Okay. The first thing is, I think uh, I think it's when Kevin Costner's making movies we all loved back then. I feel like, you know, this is when we really had this, apart from Waterworld. But I love baseball. You know, I've tried not to like baseball over the years, sort yeah. of. You know, there's a time when I rebelled and it was kind of like, oh, it's baseball. But I think I love it even more. Not because of the Blue Jays, just in general. There's this amazing nostalgia to it, which I love. Um, I also like the magic realism of it, you know. I think it's one of the few movies I've seen that can kind of pull it off. Um, and I think also it's just, it's got flaws, but in all, all of it, it's kind of a good movie. You know, I think it's well put together, even though there's lots of parts you could complain about. Mm-hmm. But mostly I think it's baseball, nostalgia, my family, my dad, and all that stuff, you know? So, yeah. I don't know, it just speaks to me. Whenever, even when it's on TV, I can watch again. I watched this the other day again, but I can watch it on TV, it's on right now, just to watch some of those goofy moments, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's been a favorite of mine, and, and um... Invariably, once a year, I end up on my brother's radio mm-hmm. show uh, mm-hmm. because he runs out of mm-hmm. people to talk to and says, okay, we can talk about movies and people will call in. They always call in and they always do. Mm-hmm. And they always ask me what my favorite baseball movie is. Mm-hmm. And they always pick Brian's song. Mm-hmm. And they always pick uh, Major League. Huge, huge fans of Major League. And Weird. Stuff. Yeah, I, I don't get it. I guess it's because it's fun. And it's sort of a funny, kid, jockey sort of, movie. Yeah, yeah, it's like your introduction like the to the porkies it. of baseball movies. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So I always pick Field of Dreams and or Eight Men Out. Those are my two yeah, favorite baseball great movies. Too, yeah. And it's because of... It's not because they're baseball movies. It's because they're movies in which characters care deeply about baseball. Sure. And my entry into it is always through the characters. Mm-hmm. And Costner, with his little window of mm-hmm. like Bull Durham and mm-hmm, his, mm-hmm. he just claimed that territory. Yeah. The, like the earnest, all-American, Gary Cooper kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it is, yeah, the magic realism is a huge part of it because so many films try for something that delicate and miss. Yeah. And Phil Alden Robinson just grabs it and gets it right from the go. Have you read the book? Yeah, yeah. See, I read the book, I think, a long time ago, but I, I don't think I associate the two together because of, you know, there's, we can talk about it later. so different, yeah. And there's also so many neat things about, and trivial thing, trivia things about the book versus the movie, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, this, to touch on that magic realism thing, like, there are parts in it, watching it again now, I thought, this could really have gone south. Like, this oh. could really seem stupid right now. Like, there's no kind of logic to it, obviously, like most magic realism. But not even the part in the beginning when he's in the field and all of a sudden there's this weird voice, which would seem peculiar to anyone, right? Mm-hmm. To have this voice speaking to you. Like, you would go to the hospital. You'd be like, this is crazy. And, of course, the wife is like, oh, kind of yeah. cool with it. You know, the, those two didn't have that, re- that relationship you could make a totally different movie. Like, the wife would be the villain, right? Yeah. Instead of being the brother-in-law, she'd be like, you're crazy, you know, you've got a farm. She just goes along with it. But there's this part, you know, the time travel part, where he goes back and sees Moonlight Graham. I mean, that is just completely... I mean, that's not... Uh, what's it called? Midnight in Paris kind of stuff. I mean, there's no... It, it's just illogical. He's just all of a sudden, he's in 1972. And that's it. Yeah. No explanation, but there's no need for an explanation. Because I think by that time, the audience is so in for it. Like, there's kind of this nanosecond where you're like this doesn't make sense and then you accept it yeah and i think that's what happens in the movie there's a bunch of parts where like this is weird like okay does he go into heaven or is why is he disappearing into the cr- no yeah done how did they just eat not jd salinger yeah <laughs> what happened there yeah i think part of it is i mean I, I like for me it's it's the uh it's the incredible 
centeredness in mm-hmm. Costner's performance, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. he shouldn't be that. You're right. He shouldn't be that calm. Yeah. Um, you're like two steps over, and you get Michael Shannon and yeah. Ch- take yeah. shelter. Yeah. And you yeah. get a raving lunatic. Yeah. I mean, he should be losing his mind. The crop. The, someone's talking to him in his crops, but yeah. he's not. And I, I kind of wonder if. I hate using the word innocence because mm-hmm. I don't think grown-ups have that. Mm-hmm. But Costner does it. Like in mm-hmm. this film and maybe a couple of others who sort of come close to it mm-hmm. where there's just this sense of like warmth and bemusement and mm-hmm. and kindness that allows us to go a little further with him. Like, let's see what's going to happen now. And it works perfectly with the baseball motif, right? Because, mm-hmm. and the father figure stuff going on. It's almost like he's got arrested development, right? When you hear about him leaving home and having this argument with his father about Shoeless Joe and all that stuff. I mean, there is sort of this arrested development thing that's going on. And I think he's got this boyishness in the movie where he's just excited and happy. And I think it's because, like, he's a boy that never grew up because, you know, his father and him yeah. kind of... And he needs that closure, right? As we know. Yeah. But, uh, but I think... Um, Amy Madigan, I think she's kind of got that too. I mean, that's why they work so cutely together because they're both kind of goofy. Yeah, you know, she's supportive in in exactly the right way. But in no movie you'd ever see a wife, you know, in that kind of typical movie to be a supportive. Like normally, the wife would be sort of the voice of reason here and be like, "You're an idiot. You yeah. know, you need to go to psychiatrist." Yeah, yeah. And I think that was sort of a. I don't recall. In the, I think in the book it's sort of similar to that too. But it, it's a book. It was just stretched out yeah. a lot more. And and it's so much more of an internal journey that yeah. I think you can also maybe buy the unreliable narrator thing where he's justifying her behavior even more. He's making it yeah. even more okay. But yeah, it, it's one of those things where it kind of needs to move through that first act so quickly because it it's to. not where the story what is. What happens? I mean, think about you know you always want to have the most exciting part of a movie as close as possible or anything like that. Yeah. And it happens fast, right? I mean, it happens right away. You do that little intro with the talking with his father and sort of the credits, and then boom, he hears a voice, right? right? But then you build a baseball field. Yeah, like that, he did that. I mean, alone. within ten minutes. That's, that's but within of... ten minutes, he's built a. Ba- I mean, that's yeah. your sort of your your montage sequence there, where he's you know got the '80s music playing, playing right? Yeah, um, it's a big accomplishment. Yeah. it's the kind of. Well, you have to get that part out of the way right away, because that's not what the movie's about. It's not about a field of dreams. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about this guy's voyage and 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 having closure and all that stuff. Um, unpacking his relationships, unpacking yeah. the the past, right yeah. and wrongs for Shoeless Joe and all that. I read that at one point when they built the stadium. The uh, the grass because I think it was probably just a bunch of you know teamsters putting this thing together who didn't know how to build a stadium. Right. Uh, the grass went quickly brown because they they're not farmers, right? And so they actually had to paint, which is actually apropos now. You think about all the droughts and like that. They had to paint all the grass green to make it look green. But yeah, and it's still around too. This yeah, field well, too. Now it's of course now it's historical. Uh, uh, now yeah. it's a location of historical importance. It's yeah, a, it's a faith site. Um, but have you read much of the trivia too? All but like the Salinger stuff. Yeah, over the years, I mean, yeah. absorbed a lot of it. And how, yeah, like, I guess he's in the book, obviously. Salinger's in the book. Yeah, and Kinsella somehow managed to incorporate, like, the one guy who wouldn't sue him because yeah. it would mean revealing himself. It's a brilliant strategy uh, for, it's, for, for Kinsella. For, did you know the Kinsella, Kinsella stuff, though, too? Like, so, W.P. Kinsella, I just want to say Warren Kinsella. Yeah. Know. W.P. Kinsella, uh, the reason why he took the name Ray is because, what the heck was it again? Uh... J.D. Salinger had a short story mm-hmm. in which his character was named, I think, Richard Kinsella, which is W. Kinsella's brother's name, or something like that. Oh. It actually was a Kinsella. Completely nothing to do with his own, just kind of serendipitous. There was a Kinsella character in one of J.D. Salinger's short stories a long time ago. Huh. So it's one of those weird kind of like coincidences, you know, that happens with a Kinsella name. But um, but I don't think most people know it's supposed I, to be J.D. Salinger, right? Yeah, well, I mean, not in the film, anyway. No, in the film. Uh, well, in the book, it's yeah, explicit, yeah. yeah. Certainly more people have seen the movie than have read the book. But, yeah. Yeah, in the, in the book, it is J.D. J.D. Salinger, Salinger yeah. himself that, that uh, Ray Kinsella's faith yeah. brings back into the world. Yeah. Although he doesn't have him writing any more books. No. And now well, they've invented a, a fake character played by James Earl Jones who is decidedly not J.D. Salinger. No, but I mean, I think he, he represents sort of what Sal, this whole idea of Salinger being like, you know, not wanting to be a sellout or, or people going, you know, like when he says, uh, uh, when he's in the truck and he says how, you know, what made you change your mind, whatever. Oh, I, I read a book at 14. It was, uh, what was it called? Or yeah. the, wa- the boat rock or whatever. Yeah, and then Terrence Mann is kind of like, oh, Christ, this is what everyone puts on me. I think Salinger, I mean, maybe more famously, maybe more kind of heinously, right? More with you know, people killing people over mm. catch- you know, having Catch in their eye in their, in, their, in their pocket. Not just famous people, but all kinds of people, right? Were like off in themselves and like that. Yeah. I think that was supposed to be a tie in there too, right? Like people blaming him for their woes. So Yeah, there aren't a lot of other authors you could. Yeah. Do you have flaws with Feel of Dreams? Like, do you have problems with it? No. Do you have criticisms? No, like, I love it. I, I actually, uh, the first time I saw it, the only time I saw it theatrically, I guess, was the opening weekend, maybe yeah. even the Friday. Um, friend, two friends of mine 
and I went down to see it in the afternoon at the Varsity. Oh, yeah. It must have been the Friday. We were all kind of working hours that we didn't yeah. have to be at work that day. Yeah. And uh, just sat very quietly, enjoyed ourselves, yeah. and then at the end, it's like, I'm not crying, you're not crying, shut up. You know, like, we just, we, we collected I, our I masculinity. I heard people cr- cried over the script, something like that. And I think actually, I think it was Kinsella, too. He went to the, you know, these directors sneak into theaters to see their own movie, right? And yeah. he couldn't believe when people were weeping. I mean, that's what, and I think even too. Sorry, Kinsella, rather. Kinsella wept when he read the script by by him. Phil Alden Robinson. And I think Aww. Kinsella went to the theater to see how it was done. And he, he couldn't believe people were crying so much. Yeah. I mean, how the hell couldn't you, though? How I mean, that part when that? he has a cat, I mean, the part with the father, I mean, every time, even now, if I watch it, I cry a little bit. Yeah. And you know? it's the most, um, that, like, I keep waiting for someone to show, um, to show a little awareness and include mm-hmm. Field of Dreams in a list of great movies with twists you didn't know. Yeah. Like, because well, that is a, that is a sort of M.I. Shyamalan part. Coming. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the book and it's not yeah. in the film which is great. He just left out one line of dialogue yeah. in the book when this starts uh-huh. when the fielders arrive and when the players are there. Kinsella says I know a catcher and it, it's the one line and it's it, nothing comes of it. Oh wow. And at the very end that's the reveal. Right, and right, right. at the right. end of the movie he takes his mask yeah. off and you're like, oh my God, of course. Which is perfect too. Yeah. Right? To have a, and of all the characters in baseball, the one that's hidden the most, right? Yeah. And just to leave that line out, yeah. Robinson, it's, weird. it's the smartest thing you yeah. can do because it turns this casual revelation into a total yeah. wallop. Like, it's just devastating. I think Ray Liotta's so good in this too when he, you know, he's got those twinkly eyes, right? And there's this great part when, you know, when, at the end when he's kind of like, you know, Kevin Goss is so mad that he's not going to the cornfield, right? He's so offended by it and, he, and he's like, well, you know, you're not invited kind of thing. And then there's this part where he kind of just says, I think you better stick around. Or I think yeah. you better stay around. And that moment to me, that's when I feel the waterworks, right? You just go, yeah. I think you better stay around. Because you know why. Yeah. And he kind of looks like this. And he's got this amazing grin in his face, right? And that's just that, there's that two seconds, which it seems like a lifetime, right? And he just takes his mask on. It's like, wait, yeah. you know? But uh, but again, there's, that's magic realism too, I think, in the sense that, like, that's that's wild, right? That his father is there all of a sudden. And, mm-hmm. and Costner's blown away for about 30 seconds but then it kind of just oh his, his recovery is so beautiful you know it's just that it's little like his you know his face is hardened by life whatever he says right and then the the wife is just kind of like oh I'm gonna go make some coffee you yeah. know like it's just sort of yeah. your ghost father will be like I don't think you can make that movie now no it's way too simple it wouldn't, first of all it wouldn't get green lit I don't think anyone anyway, this is a stupid movie I think also if you did do it the execution would be massively over the top you'd take all those scenes and make them way more kind of emotional you yeah. know and it's just kind of this lightness to this, like, kind of really creepy thing. Like, basically, you're playing baseball with your dead father, you know, in his Who young form. younger than you, yeah. Um, I mean, that's heavy, right? Yeah. But they, the only thing you could do now would be make Costner the father. Like, just have Costner show up as the, as the catcher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people would still burn the theater down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you still can't do that. But I, I just feel like there's something timeless about the movie, too. Like, just that, how, I don't think you could do it right now, you know? I think it would just be butchered, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of special about it too. This sort of references time in, in films that I think you could pull some of this shit off. Yeah, know? and it, and it's not like 1989 was a particularly bold time for movies. I was going to say earnest. Yeah, uh, there wasn't a lot. Like it was stuff was getting dark. Well, you have hints of the music. I mean, you hear that music every now and then in Field Dreams. You kind of go, "Oh shit!" Like it feels kind of like goofy, kind of late 80s movies. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the driving scenes like that. But but it just that's the only kind of cue to. You remember know, where you are, you know? It's funny. It was the same year as, as Driving Miss Daisy. And mm-hmm. I still don't see those films as coexisting no. in any way. Even though they are essentially... Mm-hmm. They're both kind of nostalgia pieces about this bucolic yeah. never past yeah. that, that was not as nice as everyone, peop- as, as everyone wants to remember. Yeah. But one is so self-consciously artful and whimsical and that, mm-hmm. you know, the happy music telling you what to feel. And then Field of Dreams where you are dealing with fantasy, but... There's also mortgages, and yeah. like, there's just a sense of, of oppressive reality. I mean, yeah, it's funny. There's not really even that you could say zeitgeist because it's kind of like they're both, you know, well, it's not a period because it's, I mean, you couldn't tell it's actually, you know, the 80s, whatever you're supposed to be, uh, I think, in Field of Dreams. Because yeah, no, there's a really pleasant kind of suspension. Even the clothing because they're Midwest, you know, like, who knows? I mean, that's what Fun they wear in the Midwest right now, right? And then, of course, there's time travel stuff going on, and there's guys in... You don't actually place it in any kind of period, Yeah, right? no, it's removed from yeah. everything, including the contemporary yeah. reality, because that sort of thing doesn't happen in the present day. And we argue, you know, the part in the beginning, uh, when they are at the, um, kind of the book-burning part, you know? I mean, that could be Midwest right now. Yeah. I mean, anywhere, actually, in the States. I mean, you could be yeah. arguing about this Salinger or any book in the exact same way, the exact same people, the exact same language, the exact same conversation, the exact same, you know... Uh, speech by by Amy Madigan so yeah I think it's a, I think maybe why I like it it is kind of timeless you know mm-hmm. so how old were you like what was your first experience with it jeez oh, I mean I guess I, so I'm 39 or so I've been 20 I guess I've been 20 years ago right uh, um, 
little oh, wait, more. Oh, wait, day yeah. nine. Oh, yeah, geez. We're in 2015, yeah. yeah. Wow. I guess I must have been... But I probably didn't appreciate it as much then, you know? But did you see it theatrically? Yes, I okay. did. Yeah. I don't think I appreciated it... Uh, yeah, 2015. I always think it's 2009. Um, <laughs> in a perfect world. Uh, I think oh, I did, but I think, I, I think I've grown to love it more seeing it on TV, which is stupid because I hate watching movies on TV, um, or on VHS or something, because I feel like, you know, as you age, especially especially things like your father and, and, and sure, the nostalgia yeah. of baseball, like, uh, I think... That's sort of what's kind of hit home more. And, and I wrote this piece a while ago for HuffPo called Field of Memes, right? And uh, he was just talking about when I was a kid, uh, I had two brothers. We'd play baseball in my parents' backyard. My parents have a pretty big uh, land, like five acres. But we had basically this big plot of land we turned into a baseball field. And, uh, you know, we kind of MacGyvered everything. So we, my brother, who's like a real statistician kind of guy, you know, he would score a, a game just like uh, Costner did, you know, which I think is the nerdiest thing to do. <laughs> Your brother probably does that, actually, score yeah. games. I don't know. I think he does it in his head now. Yeah, probably does. Terrifying. But I mean, we used to listen to radio, right, for baseball games, you know. And in fact, the other day on the weekend, I was listening to uh, 590 because I, I was on the island and the TV didn't work. And I think about nostalgia that way, too, right? Like scoring a game, listening to a game. And you're brought back to those times, right? We didn't have... TV on every day with, with baseball and things weren't accessible mm-hmm. but anyway uh, so we played baseball and we would set up a field right and we'd measure all that and we had uh, little makeshift bases and we had a little mound and since there's only two on one we'd have rules right like you have to have that when you play baseball yeah, yeah. so we turn trees into like certain players like Tony Fernandez was the shortstop and there'd be rules like it hit above the branches of an automatic out below was the ground or whatever and you know that kind of thing so um, creating this complete yeah you have to make this kind of rule because we my older brother was the one player um so, the reason why I think Field of Dreams makes sense to me now is because my brother said to me one other day, he said, uh, you know, there was a day at one point when we played our last baseball game. I mean, we, we still play baseball now, right? But right. not the same way. Sure. And our arms hurt the next day. <laughs> um, there was one day when I was 15 and, you know, my other brother was 17, the other brother was 19, where, for whatever reason, we played our last game as teenagers. And we didn't know it was our last game, right? Yeah, it was just say it. one of us probably got a girlfriend or something like that or someone went to camp. Um, so, the thing is, if we knew that was our last game, we would have played a little longer, you know? Yeah. Ten minutes, five minutes, an hour, a day, you know? But we probably wouldn't because we're stupid kids too, right? Uh, and I think that's got to do with, with Field of Dreams a lot too when, when uh, Bert Lancaster says that thing about how, you know, when he's uh, Moonlight Graham and he um, hits the, uh, doesn't get to go to bat, right? Right. And you just don't appreciate the moments, right? You don't think to yourself, I'm never going to be here again, kind of thing. I'll never be able to play another game as a major leaguer. I think that kind of ties into a lot too, like the sort of this... Looking back on on your life and moments and appreciating stuff. I mean, it's it sounds a little goofy, but I think there's something to be said about that too. And it's that's sort of the thing that hits me home every time I watch this, you know. And I think you, yeah, you, and that's one of those things, you know. It's a it's a, a truism of, of art of any art, but mm-hmm. especially movies that they're these things are frozen in time sure. forever, and we revisit them and we change the movies. Don't yeah. change. Almost, oh yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely, like absolutely. Restoration. That's why I said I didn't appreciate it probably when I was, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the other thing is too, like there was a, you don't, you don't even. You don't even have regrets when you're no. 19. No. Unless it's, you know, wanting to go to a concert and going yeah. to something else. Like, that's <laughs> that's that's the scale of it. Mom! The, yeah. the tiniest little things. There was a point in 2007 where we, we almost moved to New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kate, and, Kate and I, uh, she got a job. Mm-hmm. I was going back and forth every weekend. I couldn't mm-hmm. leave because Metro was unionizing. And mm-hmm. if I'd left, they could have stopped using me. And there was this mm-hmm. whole thing. And I had no job security. And in the end, it, was a, it ended up being a three-month gig. And she came back here and worked remotely. Mm-hmm. But... She stayed there for the whole time. There was mm-hmm. a we had an apartment on the mm-hmm. Upper West Side, mm-hmm. uh, and now every time I'm up there on West Seventy Third, I realize mm-hmm. that oh yeah, that's you know, like nostalgia is the stuff that you miss, and melancholy is the regret for things been. you didn't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? and that's what this is. That's yeah. what Field of Dreams mm-hmm. has. That yeah, I didn't appreciate it either. I mm-hmm. could understand it, mm-hmm. but I didn't feel it. Mm-hmm. And now older, you just like oh yeah, that's why it's. Well, the, the, but of course, the, the hook is here is that you know he can fix that, right? Like you, right, you yeah. can go back and, and whatever, go to your apartment or something. And, yeah, and and that's what I think gets everyone right. Is that like it's true? We were saying this the other day or earlier, um, how you know we say to people when things go wrong or things go the other way, everything happens for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. But it, in this one, I mean, he's not fulfilled because of his father. I mean, he's talking with his father early on, and you hear this from his voice when he's talking to James Earl Jones. Like, there are some closure issues. And so, I think that's everyone's dream, right? To go back and fix things a little bit. You yeah. Know? But, I mean, the father has issues, too, even though he's a ghost or in heaven or whatever, which is another question we should talk about. Where do they go? What's the deal, then? So Because I've read things even saying how, 
you know, there's multiple theories, of course. Sure. You, know, you go on Reddit, and that's your afternoon. Um, <laughs> James Earl Jones is a ghost. He's already dead. Already dead? Which makes no sense, right? Because no, you think yeah. about it, because what the brother-in-law sees him, yeah. what everyone sees him. And it would be news. I mm-hmm. mean, that's the other thing. If a reclusive author has died, Absolutely. the world would know. Absolutely. Uh, but then there are people saying, too, I read this sort of sixth sense idea that Kevin Costner's dead. What? He's, and he's already in heaven. It's like a meta heaven. So the right? whole movie is his heaven? Which means, because remember how they say to him all the time, twice, right? They say to him, is this, is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. Yeah. What if, what if okay. he's already in heaven? Because, you know, the perfect heaven, I think, would be, for you, would probably be just watching movies for an eternity. Yeah, right? in New York, yes. Um, eating, eating conditions like that. Um, so what if, if heaven is just your dream space? So his dream space would be playing baseball with, you know, the Chicago White Sox mm-hmm. or whatever. That's but but, really, but okay. that's, that's wild because, I mean... Well, in heaven, there wouldn't be any opposition, right? He wouldn't have had to fight for it. Unless that makes things even better. I don't know. Well, maybe. Unless it's sort of like the first level to heaven. I don't know. I mean, I don't know much about heaven, yeah. you know? Well, but okay, if that's heaven, then where are the ghosts coming from? Like, where... But maybe they're already they're in heaven. their own heavens? I guess. I mean, I always understood it, and I still even watch it today. I mean, I understood that they're in some sort of heaven, and there's some sort of portal or something like that from the cornfields, and they come and they play ball, mm-hmm. right? Now, why they needed someone on Earth to build a field for them... I guess is we don't need to when, we, when you start asking questions of field of dreams that's right. such a problem right? when you start analyzing it too much and you, that's maybe ruins it but let's do it anyway okay so well it, it would be my argument that building the field is what summons the ghosts because mm-hmm. that's the level of mm-hmm. um, commitment that's required right or his emotional need is such that it makes them uh, come because it's his unfinished business or if there's baseball heaven which mm-hmm. I'm sure there is of course uh, in this <laughs> situation if there's baseball heaven then they all know about his dad and they're getting back together uh, to help them out. Because you think there'd already be a field in heaven somewhere, right? Sure. For these guys that throw the ball around. So so when they are actually, they're almost doing like this kind of ghostly mitzvah to come down and help. Yeah. No, he's doing the mitzvah, this I guess. This is a least. one last mission movie. Yeah. From their, from their point of view, yeah. this is getting the gang back together. Like, is God saying to them, like, you got to go down to earth and just play with those guys a little bit and let them figure out stuff with his father? Is yeah. that sort of the idea, you know? Well, what's the voice? That's what. That's the other question, right? Like, it's not even identified. Well, no, they said credits. it's his voice. Like, some people have said it's his voice, and that's when you get into, like, he is a loon, right? Because uh, I think, actually, I heard it was Ed Harris's voice that was uncredited, but actually... That's gravity. He's no. Really? They said it's Ed Harris as well, but I it's just, not because he was, I just thought was going cool. out with... I feel well, like Madigan, yeah, he and right. Were a so that he's an uncredited voice in in this yeah. as well. I just assumed that it was Robinson. So Could be. I don't know that it sounds like Harris. Harris was in the Abyss that year. Well, maybe they middled with it. Voice. But I'm pretty sure I read that because it was because it had to do with you the know he was married to her. Oh. Um, but then anyway, not what it is, but who it is. So is it Kevin Costner himself peeking to himself in mm-hmm. some weird way? You know, like is it Kevin dead Kevin Costner? Trying to, I don't know. Future Ghost Costner. Like. Who is the voice, and why are they telling him to do that? I, I don't. This is when you start asking questions about. You're kind of like you start screwing up the movie. Well, no, I don't know if it. I mean, ultimately, I don't. Well, you don't need to know. No, it doesn't matter. But since we're sitting here talking about, yeah, (laughs) I I think the the beauty of the film is that it's created and structured in such a way that you don't don't, ask questions. You don't need to worry because if there's a lot, there are a lot of questions. You start going into it. Like I think I'm saying with any magic realist story, there are questions. You start asking questions or, or. Elements you start questioning, then you're really going to lose a plot. But I yeah. think since we're talking about it anyway, I'm going to ask. The question I've always had uh, is what happens next, which is the way a movie should end, right? Because yeah. you have this line of cars yeah. coming. What are they going to see? Are they yeah. going to see their players? Are they going to see the And how do they know about it anyway? Well, that was. I guess someone was already trying to make news out of it. Right, right, right. Is That's right. That's right. Or something. There's some kind That's of long right. background thing. Um, but it is a weird it's a great ending because mm-hmm. it gives you the sense that everything's going to be okay mm-hmm. it's like Mr. Smith goes to Washington yeah. you don't need to see him start drafting mm-hmm. bills I don't this movie anyway I feel like it's quick oh it's, it's an hour 46 just, Jeez, yeah, it's two. which is a great movie it's when fleet. it feels like it goes in 10 minutes you know yeah, like you, all of a sudden you're like oh you're playing baseball I read actually that in the very end there uh, when they were shooting that car sequence it was all locals right of, of um, what's the town called in Iowa where the little tiny town is in Iowa. All mm-hmm. locals, and he, actually the, the AD was broadcasting on the local radio station to tell them what to do, and they did three takes. The first take, I guess, they had all the, their lights on, but it looked too bright. Right. So what they did was to create the illusion of that kind of flickering of lights, was everyone had to flicker their, like literally turn their lights on and off. So that, you kind of had that oh, yeah. that feeling of, of moving lights. I mean, now they just CGI or something yeah, like that, Yeah, right? I just assumed it was shot through grass no. or weed or something. No, they just, I guess everyone went like this with their lights, kind of flickered it, um... You know, yeah, the radio. Here I am doing this. <laughs> yeah, people, people understand. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, so I think that's I think that's kind of neat about it too is that you shoot in this middle of you know the tiny town of Iowa. You know, like this this Ringwood town is still there. This yeah. this field. You know, just authenticity at every step. I mean, yeah, he did everything he could to build that movie. And I I wonder if maybe 
that's his leap of faith. That, mm-hmm. that, that's Robinson's testimonial to the material. Is like mm-hmm. I have to do it exactly. The you know the stories of Polanski on Rosemary's yeah. Baby yeah. calling our eleven and asking which copy of Time magazine. Sure. Is on the coffee table, I was like, I don't know, Roman. <laughs> I just said there was a magazine there. Uh, but everything becomes essential. Like every, yeah. every that was a real farmhouse. I think. I mean, they probably got at it to yeah, shoot inside, but, but it's a real farmhouse. Inside, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, there's a sense that this is as real as it can be for a film that is ultimately about impossible, unreal yeah. things. No, but uh, I'd love to visit there. I think I told you that that Jason Priestley story about how one time we were having uh, uh, lunch, and uh, I said to him, uh, "Which I'm doing this thing where I'm talking about how many stadiums I've been to, right?" And which is a stupid. Whenever you talk to anyone, yeah. a celebrity, so, uh, because oh, we because, introduce, no, no, I was yeah. going to say because film people are listening to this. Oh, right. I know what you're talking about. Uh, the stadium tourism thing. Which is right. going to them, and, right? And how many? So what's what's the ultimate goal? Well, I mean, I, mean, I haven't done a lot of it, but I mean, I think I've been. To, you know, I think there are people out there who go to these things all the time, right? Like they go to Fenway, they go to Yankee Stadium, mm-hmm. they go to every stadium, and I mean, it's more of a kind of a maybe not my kind of thing. You know, I would just go because I'm probably in New York, and someone gave me Yankee tickets. You know, right, I was in yeah. Boston, but there are people who actually do this, and they spend time going to stadiums and and you know we're going to go to Chicago this weekend we're going to go to Wrigley Field we're going to yeah. go to whatever I've heard of people who do East Coast trips yeah. where they stop at all the opportunities which I think is awesome first of all you yeah. know like I mean I mean you see it in Toronto a lot you see people from Baltimore and, and New York come here I think maybe because they're sold out down there and they come here and they bring their kids and come for a week, cheap weekend and yeah, take a holiday spend their in. incredibly valuable money yeah but, but I think it's awesome though I mean actually it's a relatively inexpensive vacation mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah there are people I think older people especially they go around and try to see all the stadiums and see a game there um but and I haven't seen a lot of them. But so anyway, so I was talking to. You should never talk to any celebrity about what you've done versus what they've done because of <laughs> course they've had more opportunities to do all kinds of neat stuff. So we're sitting there, and I said, "Oh, I've been to Fenway, I've been to Yankee Stadium, I've been to this and that, and how many stadiums you've been to?" And of course he spouts off a whole list of it, and he goes, "Wow, oh, in fact, I actually played a game once at at this, at this place, you know, in, at in the Iowa." Field of Dreams. And I was like, "Oh, you win, you know." And he like <laughs> Kelsey Grammer and all these guys, you know, had some celebrity tournament in the '90s, which I think to me is that's amazing, you know, like in the. Uh, Zeitka- and the, the time yeah. in the 90s when this well right after this movie was made to be playing in this sort of stadium in some you know tournament for raising money for God knows what you know yeah. freshly um, like this freshly created yeah I mean piece of pop culture but it's still there I mean you can still go there I think like I think they I think it lost some money for a while and then they they started it back mm-hmm. um, but I'd love to go visit that you know kind of like going to Tunisia and seeing the Star Wars set or something like that you know right the canyon yeah but uh, probably won't though but maybe someday you could go to. Yeah, and that's not far. It's no, it's not. To, it's easier to get to than Tunisia, surely. But I wonder what it'd be like. It'd be small and, and disappointing. I don't know. You know. Yeah. Ninety ninety feet isn't that far apart from bases. There are legendary places in the world. I think you know. I'm trying to think of the one for me. I don't even know what single location would have that impact for me. Probably the yeah okay the Universal backlot where they shot Back to the Future maybe yeah or the That'd you know what, you know what would, you know what mine would be it would be the raft it would be the raft in. Um, in Martha's Vineyard, where Brody goes out to get the swimmers on, that would be cool. Yeah, I'm sure that's got to well, sort I'm of sure be there. A tourist thing now, yeah, or you even know? just the walk he takes down the road. Yeah, but haven't you ever gone to places in, in life and always been let down? Like I think, like I went to this road trip from Vancouver to uh, L.A. or something. I was driving someone's car, literally, mm-hmm. um, for them, and uh, I stopped in uh, Monterey, I think. At the time, I was just reading, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but I was reading a lot of Steinbeck and that kind of stuff and oh, Henry yeah. Miller. And I was just in that zone, you know, 20s, something like that. And I remember stopping in Monterey and, and all of a sudden you realize it's completely like Canary Rose, completely touristy and, you know, everything you expect. I mean, it's not Disney World, but it's, it's yeah, on its yeah. way. Well, so I was in, I went to Haight-Ashbury for the first time in 1994 and there's a gap on the corner. Yeah. Just like, well, all right. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, that's now. But, you know, so I'm kind of crestfallen. I'm sitting here on Monterey and I park the car and it's kind of raining us. I mean, it's still beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sitting on the beach and all of a sudden I look to my left and some old guy's smoking a joint and playing a sax. And I said, okay, let's, we're getting somewhere. It's more right? like it, yeah. And then that night, I think I was going to drive to Big Sur and stay there for the night, right? And, and uh, but it was raining, right? And the drive to Big Sur is, is kind of perilous, right? Like it's, especially for oh, a newbie, Pacific right? Coast Highway, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, I've driven that. There was a mudslide the next day. And I was driving, but it was like 10 o'clock at night and it was raining outside and I'd never driven there before. So anyway, I was jumping in the car I said, what the hell, I'm going to go there anyway. And of course, white knuckled, you know, <laughs> now driving along, you know, and, and you hear about people, like I heard a story later that uh, that every year a motorcycle goes off the Bixby Bridge or whatever, or one of the corners and he dies, right, you know? Right, right, right. And the joke is, when they hear about a motorcycle uh, going off the cliff, did he make it? Not did he survive, right. but did he clear did the he rocks? Jump, yeah. you know? 
so anyway, so then I'm driving along white knuckle and I finally get to this inn. They could have charged me seven hundred dollars a night for this tiny room, and I would have said yes because I was just so happy to be on this damn highway. But but again, like you know, places like Big Sur or, these, or, or any of these places, like they're they're haunted by what's been there before. Sure, yeah. But it's always a little bit. Yeah, that was this is it. Well, <laughs> that's yeah. That's the big super bridge, huh? It's oh. never what you want no. it to be. I mean, I would I would say like Griffith Park was what I wanted mm-hmm. it to be because mm-hmm. it's just gorgeous. It's mm-hmm. this big expanse of space, and it doesn't matter who else is there. Mm-hmm. Um, Sunset Strip, it still has the Hustler store. It's mm-hmm. still kind mm-hmm. of seedy. You can yeah. tell. The, the first time I was in California, in the Viper Room or something. Yeah, yeah I was there. I yeah. mean, I didn't go. Which in, is a kind of a nondescript. I mean, think of the. I think yeah. the first time when I went to the Viper Room too. I was kind of, is it? Yeah, there's a liquor store. I mean, it's kind of a lousy there. little like. But but at the same time, it's kind of back to that whole idea about being there in the moment, right? Like the Viper Room, 20, 30 years ago, it was probably a pretty wild place. It was across the road from Tower Video, for you know. Time. Yeah, I remember exactly. that. Like I remember Tower Video more vividly. Yeah. Um, there. Yeah, I mean, the, the locations are never as important as what as the history. Yeah, yeah. as you say. Um, I'm just trying to think. It's like there are places in New York that I absolutely love, but mm-hmm. they're they're not tied to anything. No, they're just like the Central Park or, mm. or this bakery in the Upper West mm. Side. They're all personal. Yeah. Um, I would I would still think though that this like this location of all of them because it just because it was created for well, it'd be trippy too. I think because you can be, see it. I mean, yeah, if it it's, would be if the it's, same. Unless those cornfields will all become houses, which I doubt. Mm. I think it'd be trippy just to lead up. You oh, know, Jesus, driving the Field of Dreams lofts. <laughs> oh my God! Someone will do that. I mean, you would you would hope that it's still in the middle of nowhere, right? I think I think from what I read, it's still in the middle of nowhere, right? right. I mean, there's there can't be that much kind of expanse to get there, but. But let's pretend that it's still a cornfield. I mean, the drive up would be kind of fun, right? Just sure, seeing yeah. this thing in the distance. You know, it's like the Tunisia thing. You know, like the Star Wars set in Tunisia. Like, just feel like, are we there? Are we there? And then all of a sudden, you see this this field. No, now I'm gonna have to go see. I'm sure there's a store there too. I'm yeah. sure there's got to be a store selling Gift trinkets shop. and sure. kitchen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get but. your picture taken with shoeless Joe. <laughs> but I, want, I, I, I love films that use symbolic um, imagery. Mm-hmm. Well, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. I love films that use symbolism about symbolism so oh, yeah. you know it's not that baseball is baseball it's baseball is America or mm-hmm. baseball is hope Yeah, and what it means to individual people yeah. in the course of the film becomes important yeah. so it's the it's the way it approaches the individual character of yeah. a person who is drawn to this thing some people don't see anything some people don't want to see anything some people see exploitation yeah. and then some people see ghosts yeah well, I mean, it's like his speech, right? When at the very end, baseball, you know, when yeah. Daniel Jones says that thing, but the one thing is when constant with baseball. Yeah. And even Song says baseball in a way that no one else says baseball. He's like, baseball. Like, yeah. he pronounces it in this kind of godly way. Baseball. Uh, so that speech is the end. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, I think if a European were to watch that, they'd roll their eyes. They're like, it's not baseball. But it's not, it's not yeah. about anything but America. It's about America and history of America and baseball being current. It's true. A baseball has, I mean, apart from what's been canceled in the Second World War, uh, and I think First World War too. Like it has been a constant there. Oh, it's, yeah. it's not about a stupid game, especially now. You know, people getting paid ten million dollars to throw a ball around. It's about growing up with your your father or or you know your sister being the audience or whatever. You know, and, yeah. and now of course the sister will be playing probably. Um, yeah. But you think about those kind of things now, and I think that's what like any good movie. It's 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 not about baseball at all. It's about a man's journey with his himself and yeah. his father his and father, his daughter, his wife. Mm. There's there's a and there's a warmth that comes from Costner, mm-hmm. uh, and there's a warmth that comes from the film mm-hmm. that never feels somehow never feels syrupy because no. you, you brace for and it. And it could I, be, yeah. On I paper, was, I bet you it's more syrupy than it is. You know, uh, I was a 20 year old cynic when I saw it, and it got me. Yeah. So, it's, but it's changed you now. When you watch it now, it's different. Right? Well, now it's a different movie. Yeah. yeah which is weird because it isn't. No, uh, exactly it's exactly the same. the same. But it's but it's remarkable to watch. Like it's remarkable to watch it. With the perspective simultaneously of being the twenty-year-old who saw it the first time, yep. and now being forty-seven and thinking, "Oh well, I'm, you know, I'm closer to to mm-hmm. uh, Tom, to Terrence Mann's age than yeah. I am to <laughs> probably funny, yeah. like, probably older than Ray by yeah. now. I mean, it must be. I think he's thirty-six. Yeah, I think yeah. I remember this guy. I think he said he was thirty-six. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely like old enough to be a young father. That kind mm. of thing. But I'm probably older than. Yeah, I'm definitely older than. Uh, than with fa- than his father than the actor who played him anyway. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because he's uh, boyish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But he's Dwyer the, Brown. the guy who then. I mean, whatever his ghost form is. Yeah. You know that oh, he's, he's the idealized younger. He's, version. he's younger than Kevin Costner, I presume, right? Like, yeah. I mean, at that time, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where it's just this sudden reality check. Sense. Mm-hmm. It sounds mm-hmm. like a. It's a cliche, but it is mm-hmm. true, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, I'm. I'm older on every conceivable level. Yeah. I'm still relating to this like a kid. You're still younger I'm than Terrence Mann. I'm still feeling it like yeah. uh, yeah. You're still younger than Burt Lancaster's well, character. Sure. <laughs> the first time, anyway, but not Frank Whaley. 
Uh, I read him. I, I said that I, I don't know if it was Costner or if it was, um, or if it was. Uh, I think it was James Earl Jones. But basically, he said something like, "This was the first time I was in the presence of a movie star." And Burt Lancaster walked on the set. Like this is when he finally realized that he'd made it. Kind of, you know, that's this, this is a movie star. You know, mm-hmm. even the way he speaks, I mean, he's got kind of that. He puts on that kind of that transatlantic yes. kind of you know that Cary Grant pronunciation that you used yeah, to have that, in the pictures. That no, yeah. I mean, he he pours it on. I think more, you know, then. But I, I kind of miss that too, right? And yeah. it sort of sets the time, you know. Yeah, you know, like Esther so, always had it. I wish I'd met him. He was, at least he's gonna think I have a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, one of those incredible pre- screen presences. Yeah. Plus, he's so he's he's the guy like who matches Costner's warmth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He beams. Yeah. In a way that he maybe shouldn't, but yeah. it works so well. And I, I someday I'd love to talk to Robinson and just get him to explain how he got these performances because they are anti-cynical. No. Uh, yeah. And almost every level, and and you would almost feel, especially after. I mean, it must have been easier for. Costner, because I've met him, and it's closer to who he is mm-hmm. than even Crash Davis. Where, mm-hmm. You know, he's doing a relaxed, cynical thing. Mm-hmm. The relaxed, earnest thing—that's mm-hmm. Kevin Costner. Yeah, he's just you know casual. Mm-hmm. And I, I met him in—I want to say 2008, 2009. And yeah. he was real—he's you know that point of his. Story and he's a baseball guy too, right? Yeah, he's, he's just in his element. Player. He's just yeah. doing his thing. Yeah, uh, and enjoying himself. I read that he had to—he actually had to dumb down his baseball performance because I think he was a, a college player. Like he played a lot of college ball, he was and he good. actually had to like. Be not as good when he was, you know, kind of trepidatiously pitching to Shoeless Joe or whatever, right? Yeah. Which is kind of amazing, Aww. too. And I read that James Earl Jones actually didn't like baseball at all, which, which of course, makes that speech of his baseball, yeah. you know, to be, like, kind of even funnier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, acting. Acting, yeah. Um, I wonder if, I wonder if Ray Liotta played uh, baseball, probably. All these guys did. It's I mean, they all have the Or they had some coach. They must that, have been able to, yeah, they must yeah. have gotten cast on the ability. Yeah, or play some, just the, you know, and can you play this either? Sure. <laughs> I can, all right, we got to hire. Time we shoot. Yes, I can. I love the idea of just, okay, that's the call from some baseball coach somewhere, you know. Hey, dude, I mean, need your help for two months. Yeah. You got to <laughs> show Ray Liotta a bat, you I mean, know. I would assume there was a baseball camp for these guys. Actually, like I think I read that, I, th- I feel like it was a a college coach or something like that got hired to do this gig, you know? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds cool. not want to? <laughs> yeah. And, the, God, the currency of being that guy. So yeah. what else we have? So base, uh, Bull Durham so was Bull Durham, way before... Was, Bull Durham was 87? Yeah. Uh, or 80... Was it 88? No. Uh, yeah, it was 88, because Costner started... He broke with the back-to-back releases of No Way Out and The Untouchables in right. 87. So then Bull Durham was the following year, was 88. Right. And then Field of Dreams... And Eight Men Out came out somewhere in the middle. God, he had a bit of a run, huh? Yeah. Gosh, man. Well, but baseball was big, and he yeah. was the baseball guy, right? Yeah. He was, and the, the I think casting him as Elliot Ness was probably the launching point, just because he has that certain period American, American kind of American kind of yeah, good. But he's always a kind of a good guy, right? And he's yeah. uh, morally upright, steadfast. Yeah. Like Cruz, it's hard to believe him as a villain. I read the ones that they originally they ca- they cast. I think it was Tom Hanks. So I think it would have done a great job yeah. as well. But um, yeah. Like so, I know, it's um, funny. He's, Mr. Hanks has done a good job, but but well, I think I mean, he certainly sells it in the League of Their Own. But now you look at it now and you think, what the, you know, who else could it be? Yeah, it has yeah. to be Costner, right? Like whenever you read those things where they say they originally talked about casting so and so for Han Solo, it's like no, no, that wouldn't work. Yeah, you know, I and mean, that's always it's very easy to do that when there's no other kind of visual sure, reference. Yeah. But Costner, yeah, it's funny. I'm thinking about Hanks in in this role, and I could, I mean, certainly it's the same age, probably. In fact, he was even younger, dad, probably. Yeah, would have been. Yeah, you probably would have been about the same age. Yeah, you think so. Uh, but Hanks had that, like that acerbic streak that Costner never did. Yeah, and he might not have. Like, I don't. It would have been a little too good. I think he would have been too. Yeah, not acerbic, but also goofy. Like he wouldn't have been. Well, it changes Ray's all American right? boy. You know, Ray. Yeah, Ray would be much more cynical or at yeah. least more mm-hmm. contemporary. Mm-hmm. I don't know that you could sell Tom Hanks as you could now. Yeah, um, like he's he's great in period pieces mm-hmm. these days. He's terrific in Bridge yeah. of Spies as a guy in yeah. the fifties. Is totally comfortable in yeah. that world. But, yeah, I can't imagine this. I mean, no. obviously now, but there, there's such different energies. Even James Earl Jones, too, like having... I mean, I think that, that would be easier to cast kind of than, say, switching out costume. I don't want to knock Darth Vader here because, you know, <laughs> big Star Wars fan. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, you know, I'd love to see who they consider for him as well. I mean... Yeah. Well, who would you get to play a Salinger-esque recluse who could also convey the Who's not Salinger, of, who is Salinger, yeah. yeah. At the time, too. I mean, who's to say? I mean, but it, he's good, too, because he's kind of... You know, he's an angry old guy, you know what I mean? Like, he's sort of surly, you know? So that's that's sort of easier said than done. Uh, so I think he was, you know, he pulled it off pretty well. Mm-hmm. Cagney. Yeah, that's true. God, I love that scene when, you're in the, when they're in the VW. And another, I think, aha moment in this film is, is when they're uh, they're driving back from Chisholm. And they kind of think they screwed up a little bit. Like, they don't really understand what's happened here. Right. I mean, they, they do this a lot, right, with the film, right? They kind of they kind of go, you know, Costner kind of goes, oh, it's kind of kind of crestfallen it's like, well, there's no reason for you to be here with right. Angel Jones 
And then oh, all God of a sudden, will poke you. And he turns around, and then there he is yeah. in front, and he goes, "I heard the voice too," you know. Um, but you know, when they're driving back to Chisholm, and, and uh, all of a sudden they pick up that hitchhiker, right? And that's another thing where I go, "Oh!" And they just get in the car, and, and uh, my name is Archie Graham, and they're kind of like, and that's the thing too. That should be like that should be nowadays. Stop the car! Holy crap! Yeah. You're Archie Graham! Holy shit! Do you understand what's happening here? No, they just kind of look at each other and they kind of wink, huh? Look at that. We have yeah. a, a dead ghost in our car now. And this just carries on, you know? Yeah. It's the sense... I mean, and, yeah, it's the sense that the film is sweeping them along as much as mm-hmm. it is us. Mm-hmm. And you're right. There would be a scene... Like, Tom Hanks would definitely comment on that. Yeah, yeah. Or Keaton. I was thinking Michael Keaton could have done it. Yeah, yeah that'd be good, yeah. The, uh, the 1980... Now we're thinking of guys and Yeah, there's only... It seems like there's only three male actors. <laughs> three that, that would year, be right, know? I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I he kind of dominated his stuff. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, you were thinking somebody who could have played... Who else could have played... The Lancaster role, I think Newman could have done it. Yeah, yeah. But it's will, almost too easy. Yeah. Right? Lancaster has that grandeur. Yeah. And Newman was much more of a yeah. of a of a crank or could be a crank yeah. on screen. Like then he was doing Blaze and Nobody's Fool and stuff like films like that. Yeah. Let's say we did make Field of Dreams now mm. and we didn't fuck it up, right? Right. Uh, first of all, who would you cast? Mark for? Wahlberg. Actually that wouldn't be bad. <laughs> that would be so bad. My my nightmare... No, he's not earning he's too stupid. Yeah, kind of. you wouldn't buy you um you wouldn't buy you can buy faith, but you couldn't buy Well who would you cast in for Kevin for Skills right now? Um I mean oh, what, you we're know not what? we're not bound by like studio stuff. We not Zach Efron, like we got it we can do it who we would do it if we were studio actors. I would cast Ethan Embry. That is who I would cast. Really? Yeah, he just popped into my head, but he's old enough now that you could pull it off for Pat Healy. Yeah. A character actor ish guy who what you if maybe they want to estimate, but yeah. What if you had to pick a, fa- a famous, famous guy? We had to pick... A, you're a studio guy right now that says we have right. to pick yeah, an A-lister. Has, and he has to be young-ish, yeah. right? I mean, 30-ish. 30-ish. Is Michael Shannon too old? I put Michael Shannon in everything, but I would love to see him play warm. I would yeah. love to see him play a father figure. Fassbender's too old. Fassbender? He probably can't even throw a ball. <laughs> <laughs> never know. He's he'd, probably, he'd probably play cricket. German-Irish? He's probably throwing a ball. Yeah, too. That's probably right. Well, Germans can do anything. Um, uh, who else... Oh, well, Chris Evans, maybe. Yeah. He's kind of all-American. He's, he's almost too all-American boy. Yeah, but Captain Chris America Pine, makes it subversive. Chris maybe Chris Pine, yeah. Chris Pine could be all right. Yeah, he's. I think he could do it, because he's kind of snarky. He's a little snarky. Yeah, he's a little snarky, but I think he could be earnest, too. Um, I mean, you could put Kevin Costner as the as Terrence Mann. Or as the dad, yeah. yeah. Uh, Terrence Mann. Right, it can't be. It can't be. Really, I could be the dad now. Yeah, he oh, could be. Too, no, he's too old too. But he needs to be someone snarky too for the dad. You know, like he needs yeah. to be kind of surly. You need a connection to the present day version. I think like there's no way around that. There has to. be But there's two things. So you could do a remake. But what if you just did it now? Like I'm saying, no remake. This was just just tell the story. First of all, it wouldn't be greenlit. They're like, this is a stupid idea. Yeah. You know, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I don't know how this book sold Fantasy millions of copies. Novel, yeah. Field of Dreams sounds. Well, I think I actually read the original Shoeless. Like during Hall Shoeless Joe, like the book. Right, like the book. But then they were like, Ugh. well, maybe because the film uh, Eight Men Out, they didn't want to call it Shoeless Joe. Yeah, I'm sure that was part of it. Yeah, that's a weird thing too about these two base movies that in such a short time we'd, I mean, sometimes I, I, I would like conflate the two together. Like, like it, it's Field of Dreams. Like when is a prequel? Like when is Shoeless Joe all of a sudden become so famous? You know, like when these movies all, I mean, he's been famous yeah. or infamous. Well, they say that there's always a there's a. A generational wave that always happens where the kids who grew up reading about something become executives and greenlight things. Oh, I see, I so, see. So, whatever it is... God it helps probably, we're going to see movies 20 years from now. Maybe it was... You know, they'll just make more Transformers movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, maybe it was Fear Strikes Out or, yeah. or Pride of the Yankees. Oh, right. It's even too old. But there was this wave where people suddenly wanted to do more baseball. So, right. Well, what's funny is that there's almost an, a crossover thing because at one point... I'm pretty sure in Eight Men Out... Maybe I'm forgetting, but you won't. Isn't there a part when you see Shoeless Joe... In the stand, at the very end, isn't he in the stand or something like that? Or he's playing ball or something like that? Yeah, he was... He, sort of this legend. Like, you don't know if it's him or not? He's sort of playing alone. Yeah, so the epilogue. discussion of him maybe playing under an alias or something. But remember in Field of Dreams, they actually say that. It's almost like there's a crossover thing going yeah, on, you know? Yeah. Like, you had to, it was almost like a, a sequel to the to the yeah. game and out. I mean, well, in fact... it's just such a good story that you it found its way in. But I wonder, like... So, I, I think Game and Out actually serves as a prequel to this in a weird way. Because, I mean, not... Like, I don't know. I don't know if my mother knew who the Chicago Black Sox were. But she would have had she watched the movie before. Right. You know, it sort of serves as a little history reminder to watch that and then watch this after I think it's weird that there's these two movies of a Chicago Black Sox within such a short time and then never again yeah that's you know? true it's and like never... it is it's an amazing scandal it's an amazing story and yeah. it's well makes... Ken Burns covers it in baseball too right so yeah, yeah. maybe that's the definitive maybe couple that's... years later when was, so when was that when, when Ken Burns baseball then that was in the 90s anyway I guess so yeah it was after the fact yeah but you cover that and maybe there's just no point point. and now I mean like now how would you even what's the point of, re- of remaking the, the, or retelling the Black Sox story yeah. since sales did it so poetically and beautifully 
No, I mean, I, I hate remaking anything, but uh, yeah. but I was thinking more just like, if, if, I think it's neat to think, and also if you made this film now, like I said, there would be no magic realism, it would just be, it would be either really eerie or yeah. or it'd be explained over the top, you yeah. know? I was trying to figure out how... J.J. Abrams does Fill the Dreams. How you would insist on expl- how the ex- how the imposition of explanation would work, and I, maybe something like Frequency, where, you know, like, oh, the, the, the Northern Lights are weird today. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And it doesn't. It still doesn't make any sense. But, it, but at least you have the excuse. But that's because we're thinking that we need to explain any of this stuff when you don't, right? Like yeah, it's yeah. like you just kind of. I mean, it's kind of reminds me. You know, on AMC they showed the, again. I hate watching movies on TV um, <laughs> because it's all commercials. You know, like I can't remember who said it, but someone said how you know the, the problem with probably Cecil Cecil Demen- Cecil B. DeMille or something said. Uh, I almost said Cecil B. DeMille. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it said something like you can't what you know having on TV would be horrible because you intersperse all these moments with with commercials, right? right. You know, of course it's absolutely right. Um, I was watching uh, Shawshank or I think it was Shawshank Redemption, and and um, no, I mean Green Mile, Green Mile, um, and how there's that same kind of idea too, where like what? Like I don't get it. Like what's the fly in his mouth? Like yeah. what's he actually doing? But you just kind of go past that and you just move on. You accept it, done. Yeah. And Although I think I would say that the Green Mile actually works against it because it's so long. Yeah. Which is maybe how Field of Dreams gets around it. Because yeah. it moves so quickly. Yeah, you know what Thomas thinks. Yeah, the Green Mile lingers on things. Yeah. And also, just because of where King was in his writing, yeah. it's all body function stuff, and it's yeah. just like kidney stone. But do you think you ask yeah, more questions in Green Mile? Like, you get more time to, as, a, as a viewer to say, what the hell are the flies in yeah. there? Like, what's he doing? Is he, he's curing her? Like, is he curing her? Now is he sick? Like, yeah. does he have diseases on him? How does this work? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think it's because right. all, it's the reaction shots. There's just so many shots of people staring in awe at coffee when something happens in that yeah. movie. And that's Darabont. Like, he can't not yeah. do it. It's He does it in the majest- He does it in Shawshank, but it's yeah. okay because yeah. we're appreciating people. Yeah. Uh, and here it's just like, oh, the magic thing is happening. Everybody stare at the magic thing. I think, too, with, with Green Mile, why people don't. I mean, maybe they do get hung up, but they're also so fascinated with the execution stuff mm-hmm. like, in this morbid. You know, sadness kind of thing going on where you you do ask questions like that, but then you're back into the someone's going to get you know electrocuted kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know, the there's, ticking clock. Yeah, so so stuff. if it had there not been that kind of angle, then maybe yeah. and maybe, maybe it's just the CG because there's none of it in like Field of Dreams has absolutely no. Well, apart from they walk into the yeah, and the only special effects it has are so subtle yeah. as to think that maybe nothing happened. And that's the thing too. Like if he went back and did a remaster of this film, right? I'm sure that'd be the first thing that someone would want to. If George Lucas did this, you know, <laughs> yeah. he would go back and he would want to fix the effects of them going into the cornfield. And in fact. It's it's actually not bad at all. Like no. it's 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 not like you know, when you when you see any film, not even a sci-fi movie, any film when there's an explosion or some sort of special effects, you know, and and this doesn't look good, but whatever, yeah. we don't really care, you know. Yeah. Um, Somebody said once, and this is the oh, it was, of course it was it was James Cameron because he's a freaking genius. Uh, said that he learned in the eighties that the one thing he wanted to change technologically. Uh, if he could change nothing else working in effects departments yeah. at, at Corman actually yeah. in, the, in the early 80s and stuff like that Beyond the Stars so the one thing he wanted to change was the way the optical process would drop the quality and uh-huh. bring up more grain in a shot with an effect because the brain starts to know right. that something is going to happen no matter what it oh, is neat. if this is a mundane shot if the huh. texture of the frame has changed uh-huh. something's coming Oh wow! And so with digital opticals, he finally did it. Right, so you but, wouldn't know it's yeah. coming. Huh. And in Field of Dreams, it doesn't even have that. No, like, there is no sense that it's a move. It's like a traveling shot, yeah. and characters are moving physically, and yeah. they just disappear. And your brain goes, "Oh," because it happens yeah. so subtly yeah. that it isn't a shock, and visually that nothing has changed in the texture of the shot. But that's the one thing. If they did it again, though, they would make oh, that find thing. A way, they would yeah. they would sort of transmog They'd make it you know blend into the corn, and yeah. they make it some sort of stupid effect. Can but their it's hair just so be simple. The same color as the corn stalks. Can yeah. they maybe turn yeah. into corn? Can, they Can we get a little more corn? Yeah. Yeah. They were corn all along. The corn industry wants us to uh, to state that dial back on stuff. Can made we, of corn. We're gonna need more corn. Yeah. Can um, we have a line where someone says your heroes are made of corn? <laughs> Can we just say the word corn? <laughs> we need a couple more corns. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe the maybe the team could be like the Iowa corn. <laughs> can we do that? The can we call the can we call the Chicago corn socks or the Chicago corn cobs? And then the thing comes out and it's called Field of Corn, <laughs> and nobody understands why. Field of Great Corn, TM Cornless Joe. That's a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that oh, that's the other thing too though. So what happens then when James when uh, Terrence Mann goes into the field? Right. So what happens? Is he gonna come? Like, is he? Yeah. Are they come, killing him? So he says. He says dying. that's very confusing. He says. He says. Uh, you can't go. You got a wife and a family, which implies he's, he's not coming back, right? Mm-hmm. Or there's a risk at the very least, right? right yeah. So if there was a risk, if there were a risk, then then Ray Liotta. Would, I mean, is he dying yeah. or isn't he dying? I think because he's then he says I'm going to write about it, and make a hell of a story, and it, part of me says, okay, we're going to relaunch his kind of career, or not relaunch. I mean, he 
didn't he'll, do it on purpose. He'll return, yeah. He's going to return as this writer with some great, amazing, inspirational story, right? That's what it sort of says. But then it confuses you. says he's got a wife and kids, which yeah. it says he's going to die. Or there's a risk. Yeah, I don't think he's coming back. I think that's. I think maybe that's part of it. It's like you know, cocoon at the end mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. somebody can't come with you because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it feels to me like there's there's a finality to that character. Yeah. Um, you know, he and Doc Graham get to go talk. Yeah. About yeah. getting old. So he is sort of dying or something. So. Yeah. Or, or at least or maybe he's not dying he's in being our... spared dying. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he won't because he's happy. He's giggling. Yeah. He probably won't be back. But then there's no. also the suggestion too that the only reason this is happening is so Ray can play catch with his father, which means now that it's over. Yeah. Like, the, the ghosts are going to go away and not come back, which right. means all the people show up. <laughs> they really 20 bucks for nothing. <laughs> some guy played catch with his dad. But again, these are questions that you don't need to ask unless you're talking about something 30 years later. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, no, the mythology feels perfectly baked mm-hmm. when you see it. It's mm-hmm. complete. It's, mm-hmm. it's gotten, it's risen to the exact point in the souffle where it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. And I just compared Field of Dreams to a souffle. Well, that's okay. No. Corn souffle. No, hot dog. It's Corn a hot dog. Souffle. It's a baseball thing. Oh, yeah. Souffle made of I kind of want to go there now and look at it. Although, like I said, I'd probably be sad, like I said, because there's probably, a, uh, there's probably a, a horrible store selling Field of Dreams stuff. I drove all the way to the Magic Field and all I got, all I got was, was a t-shirt. Was a t-shirt made of corn. Hmm. So, <laughs> now I brought you down. I know, it's true. No, um, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> okay, well, so then the key question, the closer is always the same which is you know what of this film if anything have you used in your own work have you borrowed or stolen oh, okay sure reference? um you know i think because zoom works on multiple levels yeah it does i mean i don't know if i can use zoom so much i mean there's definitely some uh, parts in zoom uh where uh you could ask more questions about it you know it's not magic realism at all but there are parts where there's if you sat there and logically broke it down you'd probably find some flaws or questions with it like any film you know because I mean, you know, zoom involves uh, three different uh, uh, stories, stuff like that. Um, so I think in that way, they're not questioning too much about things, like not worrying too much about. I mean, obviously, you have to have a structure and ideas and stuff like that. But I think sometimes this leap of faith by the audience. I think if it's done well, you know, which I don't know if Zoom is, but I know Field Dreams is. I think if it's done well. I mean, I think it's done well because it's my Zoom's my favorite movie of all time, of course. But um, if it's done well, then then those questions are never asked. You know, I think when you see film, when you see a film that's failed, you know, by the critics, something like that, or, or panned by by um, audiences it's usually when this sort of leap of faith yeah. becomes a leap of faith and becomes a focal point when it shouldn't be you know like yeah. when people are questioning that over the characters or the performances that's when you fucked it up and, I, and this doesn't you know yeah. so you get stuck on stuff yeah I mean that happens so often yeah. and some movies you get the sense that it wasn't important to them in the first place mm-hmm. like again to bring back the Transformers as mm-hmm. my, as my mm-hmm. whipping boy which I always do mm-hmm. because you know I told you I used to work for Transformers comics right yeah but I'm sure your stories <laughs> made more sense than <laughs> Dinobots assemble no 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 no, no they're totally no they yeah. totally uh, absolutely I could talk yeah. about that another time but there's a scene in, in the, the latest one in Age of Extinction yeah. where they wake up Optimus and he starts screaming his first line are I'll kill you I'll kill you yeah. All. Yeah. and then later in the film he says I would never hurt a human and then later it's <laughs> Dinobots attack pick one pick one <laughs> It's fine if Optimus has been radicalized and now he's a warrior who's willing to kill humans. Yeah. Because humans have treated them like dirt yeah. for four movies. But pick one and I stay know. with it. Like if you can't, like if you can't stay on these. These are vehicles. If yeah. you can't drive them in one direction, you're screwing them up. So when you really hate something, it, it's sort of more fun to describe how it much you hate it. It can be more fun. Yeah. I mean, certainly like any of my Transformers movies. Eight hundred words. That's it. Can I get? Can I get fifteen hundred? <laughs> uh, I've been I've been lucky enough that all the Transformers movies have arrived. No, the first one I was still writing for Metro, so I turned it around. But all the Transformers movies are screened too late to mm. get into the paper, so I can go online and go as long <laughs> as I want. And I think Age of Extinction is like nine hundred words. Oh wow! And I'm just like God damn this. Stupid, thing. But, <laughs> but I can justify you just why. Be stupid word you did. I did like five hundred words on the last Witch Hunter last week. I don't even know what the point of that. Was. <laughs> I'm not convincing anybody. If you want to see the last Witch Hunter, and you're not reading reviews. Nobody's going to turn you around. I, I, do people? Yeah, I always wonder like what happens nowadays with people reading reviews. I mean, I think people go to Rotten Tomatoes and for aggregates to see, you know, mm-hmm. if it's ten or whatever, the ten percent versus. Score, yeah. But I wonder if people go. I mean, I guess I hope they do. Well, I know, you know? during during TIFF uh, on the now mini site, the reviews tracked way bigger yeah. than anything else, like any of the interviews we did. Yeah. Or any Maybe the they're actually more important now than they were before. I mean, because the online thing, like where people, I mean, I think they would probably do an aggregate. They're going to look at Rotten Tomatoes. They're going to look at Wilner or something. They're going to look at whatever. But, mm-hmm. but uh, well, because he hates everything. Yeah. Um, but I, I wonder if they're more important now because of the digital age than than before. You know, I mean, I think now that everyone is potentially a critic, mm-hmm. now that everyone like just Twitter is about. Yeah. People start to seek out the voices they know. Well, I think too, if there's so many voices too, right? If you go on Twitter and you write, you know, live Twitter and showing that, and you see like all these anonymous tweets, yeah, right? yeah, people yeah. hating it. But I think people may go towards their 
hubs, you know, like Wilner or something like that, just yeah. to see if oh, that's a regular guy, right? Maybe more than before. Yeah, you know, Nerd so, Guy 79 like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nerd Guy 79 <laughs> likes everything with a car in it. You know, like, there's... So what is next for you? Uh, I've, well, I've got a couple of little scripts I'm working on. Uh, one's in development, um, uh, so we'll see where that goes. But, uh, you know, just kind of plugging away, trying to write stuff, you know, see mm-hmm. where things happen and is, try and see is zoom on the still on the festival circuit or yeah it's been uh it's yeah it was, it's still doing a couple more it was at like sitges uh it was in uh this on uh, this fantastic fest in austin mm, yeah. it was in uh tiff obviously where the hell else was it it was at real film festival it actually closed the real film festival nice. that was cool i wasn't there uh but looked neat yeah uh so yeah, just I think it just does that and new new what's it called in Montreal the festival the oh, new Nouveau cinema yeah. yeah. So anyway, so yeah, now we'll just they'll just sort of build things up and see how things go and you know hope for the best all that kind of thing. You know, I I, I said this during TIFF. I thought it was really funny how you know, I'm googling you know Zoom Matt Hanson Zoom Pedro Morelli the director and uh, you know we all Google ourselves I guess. But sure. I thought to myself, my God, I bet there's a lot of really famous people doing this right now. <laughs> Like a lot of like, I know everyone has these, you know, these directors have publicists and assistants and all stuff to do it for them. But I, I would like to imagine that there's just one night after The Martian or whatever movie it is, and people are sitting there googling themselves. I love this idea, you know, of seeing some super. I won't even name who it might be, but some right. famous guy just sitting there on his BlackBerry googling himself. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's me, and not in a narcissistic way, just like no, apprehensive. It's you know, utterly human. Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. Like I love, you know, whenever you've gone, I've gone to like tech checks with with you know famous directors and like that, and. And sat there, and, and they've been nervous, right? Because they're basically, you know, exposing themselves the first time. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's neat about any of these kind of this process, or right? whether you're a newbie like me or some some famous guy, you know. I think it's uh, or girl or woman. Um, it's uh, it's all the same, you know. Like you're still sort of wait and see and hope for the best. I almost hope that Wilner doesn't hate it, you know. Yeah, I don't have that kind of power. Five na- five ends. I am not the voice. <laughs> My thanks to Matt Henson. And keep an eye out for Zoom, which will be coming later this year from Elevation Pictures in Canada and Screen Media Films in the USA. It has Gail Garcia Bernal and Alison Pill and Jason Priestley and Don McKellar in it. You can find Matt on Twitter at, um, I'm going to say Mattio Jelly? M-A-T-T-I-O-J-E-L-L-Y. And no, I don't know why he picked that. And you can find Field of Dreams on Blu-ray and DVD in a very good special edition from Universal Studios Home Entertainment. You can also find it for rental or sale on iTunes and Google Play. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at nowtoronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at SEMCAST, S-E-M-CAST, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. And if you want to leave a review on iTunes, this week's phrase is, go the distance. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.